In this video, I'm going to go ahead and perform a proficiency exam. That is, I'm going to take a look at a pre-calculus, that is a college algebra intro to analysis exam, and I need to take this for a job that I'm doing, so I might as well just go ahead and record it as one person who is experienced. Hopefully this will help you. That's today on High Peak Education. Thank you everyone for joining me. So this is just going to be me on the camera today explaining. And furthermore, I'm just going to copy and paste the problems, do them one at a time, and then hopefully you enjoy this and learn a lot. So let's get right to it. Okay, so for this first question, it looks like we have an angle here that is theta as four radians, and we're going to express that theta to the nearest second. Okay, so the idea is that because there are no units listed here on the angle theta, we're going to assume that that's in units of radians. Remember, radians are sort of the unitless angle. So what we want to do is we want to first convert four radians into degrees. So let's go ahead and convert that into degrees. And we're going to use the exact conversion to be as exact as possible because we want to get this in degrees, minutes, and seconds very precisely. Okay, so first to start off, we're going to have four radians multiplied 180 degrees over pi. That's because there's pi radians in 180 degrees. So that'll get us to units of degrees. So let's use the calculator to perform this calculation. So we have four times 180. So that's four times 180. And that's going to be 720. So we'll go ahead and write that down. And that's going to be in units of degrees. So now that we have this, what we should do is we should use the calculator function to convert from decimal degrees to degrees, minutes, seconds. Now the calculator can do this for you. There's also online calculations. Hopefully many of you also know that one minute of a degree is equal to 1 60th of one degree. And one second is 1 60th of a minute. So we're basically using units of 60ths to be very precise here. Now you could go ahead and find the 60th portions of this. That would be a little hard to do. Basically what you'd want to do is you'd want to convert this to, I mean, fractions and things like that. I mean, it can be done, but I would prefer, let's go ahead and just do this as the calculator shows us. So let's go ahead and figure out where that function is. Okay, so let's go ahead and take 720 and let's divide by pi. So that gets a very long decimal in terms of just degrees. Now notice that's one of the ghost answers and that is incorrect. So that first answer is incorrect. So I'm gonna go to this menu, which is angle so I have to go second, hit this apps button, and notice there's an arrow here in number four that says DMS. So that means convert to degrees, minutes, seconds from decimal degrees, from regular degrees that have a long decimal. So I'm going to convert to degrees, minutes, seconds, and I think this is what we should have. We should have 229 degrees, 10 minutes, and almost up to that next minute, but not quite. Now, let's have a think about <clears throat> if this seems to make sense. So 0.18, so 0.18 would be like 18 hundredths. So 18 hundredths, is that like 10 minutes? So a minute, remember, is a 60th. We talked about that here. So 10 over 60 would be 1 sixth. So 1 sixth, is indeed 0.167 if you round it to three decimal places. So this 0.18 is pretty well covered by this 10 minutes. And then we have a little extra. So, you know, 11 60ths, which it almost is, because this is almost 11 minutes in terms of an angle, is 0.1833. And I think that's pretty close to the answer where we have here in terms of the decimal degree. So I'm going to go with this for the correct answer. And that's going to be the second choice, I believe. Okay, so I'm going to select that for my 
exam here, and I'm going to move on to the next problem. So here we have a function, which is a square root function, and we have a polynomial underneath the square root function. Now remember, when we talk about a domain, you think about that as all the possible input values to a function. Another way of thinking about this is, what are all the x values that you can plug in legally where some mathematical issue won't occur? We recall that a square root produces an imaginary number, which is not part of a real domain, if what's underneath the radical is less than zero. So in other words, we want, for the domain, we want what's underneath this radical to be greater than or equal to zero. So let's write that down. We'll say x squared minus 3x minus 4 has to be greater than or equal to zero for the domain. Okay, fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider this polynomial, and I believe that this probably factors. So it's a trinomial, three terms, and we consider factors of negative 4 that also add up to negative 3, and I believe that would be negative 4 and positive 1. So if we go x minus 4, and then we go x plus 1, we'll say that's greater than or equal to 0. Now, by the way, for reasons that aren't necessarily obvious at this point, I am going to switch the order of those, and you'll see why that'll be useful. Okay, so multiplication is commutative. I can switch the order, no problem. And notice, what are the zero values that I get out of this? So what we're going to say is we're going to say the zeros are going to be at x equals negative 1 and x equals 4. Well, if we consider those what should happen is the function either changes from positive to negative at those points or negative to positive. By the way, on the recording, you'll hear there's a lovely lightning storm out there. So as a meteorologist, I welcome that and you get an extra added benefit. But consider what x squared minus 3x minus 4 probably looks like. If you were to make a very brief sketch, at negative 1, there'd be a 0. At 4, there'd be a 0. And the parabola should roughly look like this. Okay, it's a very rough sketch, but hopefully you get the idea with that being the y and x axes. Well, consider, I think this function that's underneath the radical is only negative between negative 1 and 4. It's 0 right at those points, and it's positive past those points. Because consider, if I plug in, say, 5, 5 squared is 25, minus 15, that's 10, and then minus 4, that's 6. So the square root of 6, that's okay. And any values that are larger, this term dominates the x squared. And so that'll be values over here, positive, and so positive square roots are fine for the domain. And then vice versa, because you're squaring varying sort of negative values. And anyway, so what I'm thinking is that for this region right here, we're going to go negative infinity to 1 with a bracket because we're going to include the 1s. So that's this first region over here, okay, which again corresponds to this region. And the other region is, again, x value is greater than 4, so that corresponds to this region. So that's going to be 4 up to infinity for x. Parenthesis always goes around infinity because we never get there. We, we only approach it. Let's put a bracket around 4 because we can equal 4. If I put in 4 to this polynomial, it's the square root of 0, which is okay. But I just can't take the square root of a negative number to be on the domain. There should be a union between these two because I should take both intervals. I should unite them together. I'm going to look for the correct answer. And oops, even though I said negative 1 out loud, this should be a negative 1 right there. And I'm thinking that this first one looks correct. So let me look at this carefully. So it's not between them. It's not only the left-hand interval. It's not all of infinity, and it's not certainly from 5 to infinity. So this definitely has to be the right answer. So I'm going to select the first choice, and I'm going to move on. Okay, so here we have the graph of a function f is shown. <clears throat> Use the properties of symmetries, shifts, stretches, and or reflections to find the equation for g based upon the graph of f. Now this is probably just supposed to be like a cursive f here. Um, probably the code there, they just kind of messed up, but anyway. Um, so, let's have a look at the graph here. 
looks like we have a piece of an upward facing parabola here from 1 to 6. Now let's have a think about what that means. If we go from 1 to 6, this is only 5 units. Let's make sure that G here is also 5 units long in terms of its distance. So this is negative 7 to negative 2, so that's okay, that's still 5 units. But a couple things I think have happened. So first of all, I think that we certainly have shifted it a little bit and perhaps even reflected it. And let's talk about why I sort of know that. Well, first of all, do you see that if I just reflected this only across the x-axis, the graph would go up to 4 instead of down to negative 4, and it would sort of go like this, and in, instead of going up to uh, 5, it'd go down to negative 5, so it'd be like that. So that would be a x-axis reflection. By the way, an x-axis reflection is like taking all the y values and making them negative. So what I think is would happen in that sort of case is there'd be a negative out front of the equation. So I'm going to basically discount this one almost immediately because this parabola or partial parabola definitely has to be turned upside down. If this one opens up, this one opens down, we can't have not a negative out the front of the function. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, even if I reflected it across the y-axis, and by the way, if I reflect it across the y-axis, basically all the values of x that I allow to be positive, namely from 1 to 6, have to become negative 1 to negative 6. So that means the function would start here, it would go down to here, let's see, yes to negative 4, and then it would go up to negative 6, yes. Or uh, when x equals negative 6, then y would be 5. So, yeah, so something like that. But notice that's a little bit off because negative 1 to uh, negative 6 is not between negative 7 and negative 2. But I am thinking it does have to have a reflection across the y-axis as well. So that means there should be a negative out front of the x. So a negative out front of the x would be, so for the part that, so scratch that, even if I did reflect this over, notice that if I performed a x-axis reflection, this is going down the same way that g is going down. So I think that's actually okay. So I don't actually need a y-axis reflection. In fact, this is the only y-axis reflection right there with that minus x, so we're not going to have a y-axis reflection. So if I also allow this to first get moved, so I'm thinking about flipping it upside down, but also moving it. I want to move it so that this negative, or sorry, this 3 now becomes the x value that moves it over here. So I'm thinking that if we start here at 3 and we end up there at 5, we have to go 8 to the left. And if we're going to go 8 to the left, what that means is that's got to be like x plus 8. Now remember, I've explained this to several of my students, so if you've watched my videos before, hopefully this makes sense. But when you're that close to x, it's like you and your best friend. If the friend is feeling positive that day, like the plus 8, you are feeling negative. So it sort of compensates. You're sort of fooling the function by shifting it horizontally. When the x is got a plus 8 here next to it, then this x goes minus 8 to the left. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's why we need an x plus 8. Okay? So that would shift this over. And then I think we should definitely have a negative um, out the front for a x-axis reflection. So let's see what that would give us. That would give us shifting this over. So let me go ahead and uh, 
draw this. All right, now I'm going to shift this over A to the left. So A to the left means instead of starting at 1, I'm starting at uh, negative 7. Yes. And then now let's notice what is this thing's, sorry, what is this thing's maximum is now lined up with this thing's minimum. Then I'm going to put a negative out the front to do a reflection across the x-axis. Okay, so let's see what that gives me. So what that means is this point stays, this point stays, but this point, which is at negative 4, becomes positive 4. And then this point, which was at 5, now becomes negative 5. So if I turn it upside down, it roughly looks like this. Now, by the way, up to this point, what we have is we really have f, just to keep track, of x plus 8, because we horizontally shifted it 8 units to the left. And then we've also got a minus out the front. Okay, now I don't know what you think, but I think that that looks pretty close. But I would also say that that's not quite right. So let's consider how we might also modify this. Now, what we need to do is we probably need to perform a... We need to perform a vertical stretch or shrink. And let's think about why we might want to do that. This is the value 4, just like this was negative 4. But now this is at the value, looks like 3. Yeah, now I could be wrong about that, but I think this value here is 3. Now be careful. Okay, this takes explaining. Suppose the function g was just vertically shrunk or stretched. If it was vertically shrunk, notice the only possibilities here are 2, uh, 1 half, 1 half, or 1 half. Now, there's more one-halves, so I'm leaning towards one-half for the answer. But it turns out that it is going to be one-half, because if I take 4 and I multiply by 2, then I'll get 2 down here. That's right there, but then that could be shifted up. And the reason that must be shifted up is because this is an x-intercept. That is a 0 on the x-axis. And even if I multiply that by 2 or one-half, it's not going to stretch it or shrink it. So this has to be moved up at the end. So you see that hopefully I'm going to multiply by one half. So that means this is out. We've already got the negative out front. So I need a one half out the front. And that means the new function we generate still is anchored here at these x intercepts, but now is here at two. And this point down here, which was at five, is now going to be at five negative 5 halves. So instead of being at negative 5, it's now at negative 5 halves. It was like negative 2.5, which is like, I don't know, maybe right about there. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so then this is our g function. Uh, before it's, uh, uh, well, this is our new f function. It's almost g. Okay. <laughs> now, one last thing. We notice that the purple function is exactly like the g function, the black function, except it does need to be moved up. And in fact, it probably should be moved up by exactly one unit. So if it's moved up by exactly one unit, so this has to be shifted up by one unit to get to here, here, and then this point shifts up one unit, and even this x-intercept got shifted up one unit, then we have just the perfect function for g. So it's a little hard to see because it's a little busy, but that's the black curve. I'm sketching that in orange. So if I go plus 1, then I should have, finally, the function for g of x. So I'm thinking that that is this last one, negative 1 half, f of x plus 8, plus 1 for g of x. Okay, if you didn't follow all of that, that was a little difficult, but hopefully my explanation adds some value. So I hope that makes sense. I'm going to move on to the next one. Okay, what we have here is we have a logarithmic equation that we must solve. So we must solve this for x. Now notice, if this 2 was not there, then it would be somewhat easy. We could use sort of the 1 to 1 property. We could say 5x plus 1 equals 2x minus 3. Then it'd be sort of easy to solve. But the 2 is there. So whenever you have multiple logs in an equation, you pretty much need to unite them as a single logarithm that can be canceled out. 
So what we need to do is we need to condense these logarithms. So the method we're going to use is we're going to move logarithms to the same side of the equation, condense them using logarithm rules, then exponentiate both sides to solve for x. So let's move the logarithms to the same side of the equation. So what we'll have is, in step one here, log of 5x plus 1 minus log of 2x minus 3 equals 2. All right, fine. So that's step one. Step two, we're going to condense them using logarithm rules. Now, what does that mean? So hopefully you recall one of your log rules is that the log of A minus the log of B is equal to the log of A over B. That's the condensing rule for subtracting, making a single logarithm, which will be useful here because we'll end up with a single logarithm, just a function of x. So employing 2, so this is just the rule. I'll put that like in a parenthesis there, if you will. Um, it's going to be log of, and that's going to be 5x plus 1 over 2x minus 3. I can drop the parentheses on each of those just because the fraction bar is an implied grouping, and still equals 2. All right, so that takes care of the second. Okay, third step, and this is probably the most important step a lot of people have trouble with. We're going to exponentiate both sides to solve for x. So what do we mean by exponentiate? Well, in other words, we need to introduce the inverse. So introduce the inverse of log. Now log is what we call the common log. Common log is assumed, so you assume base 10. So a lot of things in this world are base 10. So a lot of things like bells in terms of sound, not exactly decibels, but bells, which is what decibels is based on. Um, you could also imagine things like the pH scale are somewhat based upon powers of 10. Um, even the Richter scale for earthquakes very similarly kind of based on 10s. So what I'm trying to say is 10 raised to the log of just, let's call it something, let's call it A, would just equal A. So that would cancel it out, okay? Now, if you go 10 to something on one side, you have to do it to both sides. So whatever you do to one side, you must do to the other. So for step three here, exponentiating both sides, we're going to go 10 raised to the log of 5x plus 1 over 2x minus 3 equals 10 raised to the 2. Now, 10 raised to the 2 is 100. But then this 10 in log right there, just by this rule that they're inverses, they cancel out. So you just get 5x plus 1 over 2x minus 3 equals 100. Okay, that's not too bad. Now that's sort of like a regular algebra equation that we can solve. I would suggest we multiply by this denominator. So let's do that. So multiply by, so that's going to be, let's see, 5x plus 1 equals 100 times 2x minus 3. Which, by the way, we must distribute this 100 just because we want to just level the playing field in terms of like terms with x terms and constants. So this is 200x minus 300. Okay, and then I think we could get all the numbers on one side and all x's on the other. So I'm going to suggest we add 300 both sides and subtract 5x both sides. So what happens when we do that? Well, the right-hand side is going to become, by subtracting the 5x, 195, and then adding 300 to both sides, you get 300, there we go, 301. Okay, so then let's divide by 195. So we get x equals 301 over 195. Now that seems to be one of the answers, 301 over 195. But one thing I do want to do is I want to check it in the calculator, okay, for a couple reasons. Number one, this is a difficult problem. <laughs> Number two, 
301 over 195, perhaps that fraction would simplify, but I don't necessarily want to consider common factors of 301 and 195. Those are big numbers. I'd rather let the calculator handle that for me. And then last, sometimes when you insert x values into the logarithmic equation, it ends up that no solutions exist. In other words, you get an extraneous solution, and that's because you can't take the log of a negative number. And for that matter, like sometimes there's funny things that happen with these logs. So I'm actually not going to circle this for the answer yet. I'm going to assume that's probably my best answer for now, but let's try it. So let's see what the calculator says about possibly even simplifying that fraction. So 301 over 195. Okay, so it's a messy decimal. And then let me go math, hit the fraction key. Okay, so 301 over 195. Okay, so at least that fraction doesn't simplify. And I didn't think it did because these are sort of long fractions here. But let's see if the solution exists. So let's take 301 over 195 and let's go times 5 plus 1. Okay, so it's that fraction. And I want to go log of that fraction. Okay, so that's 0 0.94041 blah blah blah. Okay, then let's try it on the right hand side. So I have to go, let's see, 2 plus, and I'm just going to type this in. I'm going to go log of 2 times, I'll go parenthesis here, 301 over 195, close it off, and then go minus 3. That's order of operations. Okay, so I think this is the same answer. Now, Obviously, I could get it wrong because of possible round off error, but I didn't get anything extraneous. Like, in other words, I didn't get like, you know, that it's the log of a negative number or something. So I didn't get like no solution or anything. So anyway, I'm going to go with the third one down because I am 99.9% because I am 99.9% .9 sure that this is the correct answer. Okay, so hope that makes sense. That's kind of a difficult problem. Hopefully that makes sense to you. I'm going to move on. Okay, so here what we have is a function, which looks like a quadratic function. And we want it in the form a times x plus, uh, sorry, x minus h squared plus k. Now, you may be wondering what this form is. So this is what we call vertex form of the equation of the parabola. So a is a constant, not zero, not equal to zero. And then h and k can both be zero, but it turns out the point h comma k is going to be the vertex. Remember what the vertex is. That's the minimum value for a parabola that opens upward. And that's the maximum value for a parabola that opens downward. And remember, that's also something that's called the turning point. Remember, a parabola only has a single turning point. So... You know, that sort of, it's like the um, caps off the bottom of the range if the parabola opens up. Parabola opens up, it has A greater than zero, positive value for the A here. And then when A is less than zero, it has a maximum value for the vertex, and that caps off the top of the range. Okay, so anyway, let's kind of get into it here. This is written in general form, but I don't want it in general form. I want it in vertex form. So to get it in vertex form, I have to do an important thing that hopefully you learned. I have to complete the square. Now, the reason I have to complete the square is because all of these answers have binomials squared in them. So that's exactly what I need to do. I need to construct a binomial squared. That's called completing the square. Now, completing the square is not necessarily super easy. So I'm going to walk you through the steps. I'll first mention the steps like sort of in their full-blown form uh, in a numerical list, the numerical order list that you must perform them in, but then I'm going to demonstrate them. I'll highlight them with the corresponding color and then demonstrate them below. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to first factor out the constant term on the x squared. So we'll do that here to begin. We will then take half the middle coefficient. So we'll just extract that as a side separate calculation because that's part of the algorithm, the process of what we must do. We will then square the result of the half of the middle coefficient. Okay, so the middle coefficient is on the x term, that is on the linear term. 
we're going to square that. So we're going to add the result of step three inside the parentheses. So we can just do that because we're sculpting this equation to be what we want it to be. But then this is by far the most important step. So step number five is the most important step of all. So we're going to subtract on the outside with the opposite, being sure to note the factored number. This is really important. It's almost easier if I show you, but since we're adding something on the inside of the parentheses, we need to subtract on the outside. Now, by the way, it's very possible you could have to add on the outside because the number factored out could be a, a negative, but in any case, you have to do the opposite of the factored number. It's easiest if I demonstrate that to you. And then last but not least, we're going to factor and then combine the numbers. And that's pretty straightforward to finish the problem. So let's do each of these steps one at a time. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to first just go ahead and factor out the constant term on the x squared. So first, I'm just going to factor out the constant term on the x squared. So it's going to be 4 times x squared minus 4x. I'm going to close that off and then just go plus 3. Easy enough. I just factored out the 4, so this just became x squared. You have to make the coefficient on the x squared 1, and then negative 16 divided by 4 is negative 4. Okay, fine. Then what we're going to do is we're going to follow step 2. We're going to take half the middle coefficient. So half the middle coefficient is negative 4 over 2, which is negative 2. Fine. That's all we need. Step number 3, we're going to take this number that we just obtained in step 2, and we're going to square it. So we're going to take negative 2, and we're going to square it, and we're going to get the number 4 in this case. Okay, fine. That takes care of step number 3. Now for step number 4, we're going to add this result here, this 4, inside the parentheses. So I'm going to put plus 4 right there. So that got put in there because that's what we calculated. We did half the middle coefficient, and then we got negative 2, and then we squared it. We got 4. We add 4 in there. Okay, so we're all set for step 4. Now notice, if you can tell, this parentheses, this trinomial, is now going to factor. But we're not going to do that yet because we have to perform that all-important step number 5. So here, ladies and gentlemen, is step number 5. So step number five says we have to subtract the opposite. Now, usually, if you, you can't just go around adding four to any equation you want, especially on the same side of the equation. You would have to subtract four. But what you're not going to do is you're not just going to subtract four. Notice that it also has this four, this one, the red one, on the outside. So really, this is four times four. So that's really like, well, 16. In fact, we're like subtracting 16 to get rid of this because we essentially added a positive 16. I hope you see that. So this isn't just a 4. It's a 4 underneath the umbrella of a 4 there. So you have to subtract negative 4 times 4. In other words, negative 16. Now, by the way, almost always you're going to be subtracting. Not always, but almost always. That's because you're always going to add here because whenever you square something, it's positive from step three. Only if this term on the outside of the parentheses is negative would this end up being a positive in step five. Otherwise, it's pretty much always a subtract. So just keep that in mind and we can proceed. And then last but not least, let's go ahead and factor this trinomial and let's combine these terms. So we factor this trinomial. We're going to have x minus two. Now, where's the minus two come from? Well, we're going backwards from squaring, so it's actually going to come from here. So this is like x minus 2 quantity squared. You could prove that to yourself by doing x minus 2 times x minus 2, just FOIL it out. You'd get x squared minus 4x plus 4. Then here with these terms, it looks like we're going to have plus 3 minus 16, which is really, for the final answer, f of x, the final function, is 4 times the quantity of x minus 2 squared. And then positive 3 minus 16 is minus 13. And I believe that should be the answer. I'm going to look for that up here. And 
let's see. So the first choice and the third choice look very similar, but I need a four on the outside and a minus two in here, not a minus four in there. So I'm gonna go with the first choice here. So four times the quantity of x minus two squared minus 13. And I believe that should be the correct answer. So hopefully that made sense. You should know how to complete the square from these steps. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to move on. So here we have a trigonometric identities problem where we have to use the concepts from trigonometry to simplify this. And it looks like we need to simplify this down to a single trigonometric function. So the question is, which of the following is equivalent to tangent x plus cosine x over 1 plus sine x? Now, especially this denominator of 1 plus sine x that almost immediately screams to me, you should multiply the top and the bottom of this fraction by one minus sine x. Now, how do I know that? Well, one minus sine x times one plus sine x would be like one minus sine squared x, but that would be cosine squared x by the fundamental identity of trigonometry. In other words, sometimes it's called the Pythagorean identity for trigonometry because sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. So 1 minus sine squared x is just cosine squared x. And then when you have cosine x over cosine squared, good things start to happen. Anyway, you'll go ahead and um, go on from there. Okay, so let's see what we can do by doing that. So let's multiply the top and the bottom by 1 minus sine x and one minus sine x. Okay, so we're gonna get, let's see, tangent x plus uh, cosine times one minus sine x over, let's see, and then remember, this is like a difference of squares, so it's gonna end up being one minus sine squared x, because it's one times one, 1 times negative sine x, sine x times 1, so those cancel, and then sine x times negative sine x minus sine squared x. But again, by the Pythagorean identity, sometimes called the fundamental identity, this is going to be cosine squared x. Oh, and sorry, I forgot the x on the cosine. Apologize for that. Okay, so I snuck it in there. Hopefully that makes sense. So this should be tangent x plus cosine x 1 minus sine x over cosine squared x. And notice that these cancel one of those cosines. Now, let's see if we can clean this up a little bit. This is going to be tangent x plus, and this cosine x, one of these cosine x cancel. So we have 1 minus sine x over cosine x. Now, we need to get down to a single trigonometric function. So this 10x has been hanging out in the front almost the whole time, so I'd like to be able to cancel it. In other words, I'd like a positive and a negative. So let's see if we can take this fraction and split it up into its component parts. In other words, we can split up the numerator over subtraction if, indeed, we can just go 1 over cosine x and minus sine x over cosine x. So this would be tangent x, and then we're going to go plus 1 over cosine x, and then minus sine x over cosine x. There we go. But wait a minute. Hopefully you remember some of your trigonometric identities. This is one of the reciprocal identities. 1 over cosine x is exactly secant x. So this is secant. But sine x over cosine x, that's a famous one you should have on your identity sheet. That's tangent x. So what that means is on the next line, we'll get tangent x plus secant x minus tangent x. And lo and behold, look at this. These tangent x's exactly cancel. So for this final answer, we just get secant x. So that should be the second choice down. We should not leave it as 1 over cosine x because even though cosine is a little more fundamental, you might say, than secant, one of my old teachers used to say there are no fractions in trig. And what she always meant by that is 
one over cosine can always be written as secant. In other words, anytime you have a fraction, in some sense, it really can be written in terms of its reciprocal functions. You should never have to sort of leave a fraction in the final answer of a trig problem if you're really trying to simplify it. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that answer. Hope that makes sense, and let's move on. Okay, so let's have a look at this problem. It says the population density D, that's people per square mile in a large city, is related to distance in miles from the center of a city by D equals 5,000 X over X squared plus 36. Okay, so what happens to the density as the distance increases from the center of the city? Okay, so let's have a think about what's going on here. So 5,000 X is a linear function and then x squared plus 36 is a um, is a quadratic function. So what that means is, suppose you make x equal to 1, you know, the population density is pretty large. It's going to be like 5,000 over 37. If you make x equal to 2, that'd be like 10,000 over, I suppose that'd be 40, and so on and so forth. Now, so let's first think about when x is really large. When x is really large, the denominator dominates. Okay? And when I say dominates, I mean that suppose x is, I don't know, a thousand miles. So a thousand squared plus 36 is going to be a lot larger than 5,000 times a thousand. At least generally speaking. So what I'm getting at is we know that as x gets really big, suppose x is like a million, a million squared plus 36 compared to 5,000 times a million, the denominator is way bigger this time. So what that means is um, when the denominator dominates, we're going to approach zero and this will decrease the function, okay? Now, if we want to decide if the function only decreases the whole way or if it increases, then decreases. Now, it's not going to increase the whole time. Definitely not. It's not going to decrease, then increase. And now it could remain constant and then decrease, but I don't think that's going to be the case because, again, remember the examples I just mentioned? If x was 1 or 2, those were different numbers just by those numbers. I don't think it's going to remain constant or a decrease. So just like taking a standardized exam, we've narrowed it down to two choices. Now, we want to determine if it increases, then decreases. Now, this is where I'm going to recommend you should graph it. So I'm going to use Desmos, and I'm going to use the graph and calculator feature on Desmos. So going back to the function, it's 5,000x over x squared plus 36. So let's see, d of x is equal to, and I'm going to go 5,000x over, I'm going to hit the little slash, x squared uh, plus 36. Now you don't see anything at first, so we probably need to zoom out. So let's see what happens. Uh, let's see what happens when I zoom out. Okay, so we kind of now see what's going on. So we don't really care when x is negative because that's not really sort of physical. So let me go ahead and focus only on x greater than or equal to zero. So only that part. And interesting, it looks like it does have a peak here at about six. So it seems to increase first and then decrease. Okay, now most of the time it's decreasing. But that would actually make sort of sense for a city. Because you could imagine when x is really small, 5,000 times x is actually growing a little faster than x squared is. Because x squared hasn't gotten that big yet, at least not with the plus 36. So what that means is in the very center of the city, maybe there's like a lot of commercial buildings or museums and things. A lot of people live there, but maybe not so many people. Maybe that's the government city center. And a lot of people live near city center, 
but the most number of people live six miles from city center. That's like the beginning of the suburbs, let's say. But then as we move away from the suburbs, the population decreases quickly, okay? So let's see if I can just make the graph settings look a little better. So I'm gonna label that X, D of X. I'm gonna start the X axis at, let's go negative 10, it's a little easier to see. And let's make the X steps 50. I'm gonna take off the minor grid lines and let's make the Y steps also 50. Notice it's not a perfectly square grid, but let me see if I can zoom square. Okay, so yeah, that's pretty good. So hopefully you can kind of see how this graph looks. Okay, so now when I clicked on zoom square, I made sure that each of these boxes was zoomed to a square and that each side of each box is 50. So again, if I click on the curve, you can see where the maximum value is. The maximum value is at six. Now this is a pre-calculus class. Finding a maximum value is hard to do unless you have calculus at your disposal. So the fact that we don't have calculus at our disposal, we can't easily find that maximum value. In a class like this, generally they'd expect that you would graph it. So I will take a screenshot of this. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. What we have is we have d of x is 5000x over x squared plus 36 has a maximum value at x equals 6 and then decreases. So I'm thinking that it's going to increase up until kind of those city suburbs, if you will, about six miles from city center, but then it's going to decrease. Okay, so I'm thinking it's the third choice down. All right, hope that makes sense. I'm moving on. Okay, on this problem, we're asked to find the exact solution of 125 times 5 to the negative x equals 30 using natural logarithms. Okay, so natural logarithms. So that means our final answer is probably going to have ln in it. So ln is log natural, okay? Uh, the answer also could be none of the above. But let's see if we can get on to solving this. So this is an exponential equation, so we are going to have to at some point introduce logarithms. But we want to try to isolate the x as much as we can. So I think we want to divide by 125 to get started. So we have 5 raised to the negative x. And that's equal to, let's see, so that's 30 over 125. So I'm going to have the calculator handle that for me because, and I want a fraction. So 30 over 125. And I'm going to go math, frac, and it's 6 over 25. Now let's think about what that means. 5 was the greatest common factor of 30 and 125. So 5 goes into 30 6 times. 5 goes into 125 25 times. So... That means we have 6 25ths. So this is 6 25ths. Now, 5 to the negative x, hopefully you know what that means. That's like 1 over 5 to the x, because that's a property of negative exponents. So this is 6 over 25. But what we could do is we could either flip both sides or cross multiply. So we could do either one, but I'm going to suggest let's just reciprocate both sides, because you flip it upside down, it's the same thing, as long as none of these are zero, which they're not. So five to the x is equal to 25 over six. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. Now if we have five to the x equals 25 over six, this is an exponential equation for which, you know, 25 is a power of five, but the six is definitely not. So we need to introduce logs. Now I would, it generally choose log base 5 just to kind of get this 5 to go away nicely but we're told to use natural logs here so let's introduce the natural log the natural log of 5 to the x is equal to the natural log of 25 over 6 okay so there we go now let's see what happens so this x can move down so it's going to be x times ln of 5. That's a property of natural logs. Hopefully you're aware of that. Property of logarithms. Okay. Now, let's see if we can make this even a little more clever and careful. I want to divide by ln 5. So x equals ln of 25 over 6 over ln of 5. Now, some of you may think that's the final answer, but 
that doesn't look like any of the choices. And I'm not inclined to go with none of the above unless I might be able to simplify this. And let's see if we can simplify this. Recall with the numerator, the ln of a over b is equal to the ln of a minus the ln of b. So if you go from a division inside a natural log, it can be a subtraction. The reason that might be useful is because I think we can use another property on the 25 there. In fact, we can probably do, let's see. Um, so let's go, yeah, ln 25 minus ln 6 all over ln of 5. Okay, remember this all equals x. Now, ln of 25, 25 is the same thing as 5 squared. Hopefully you're aware of that. But there's another natural log property. And that is what I can use here is that if I go ln of some constant or something raised to a power, I can just write that as c times ln of just that constant. In other words, the exponent can come down. So I'm going to suggest we write this as 2 times ln 5, because the 2 came down, minus ln 6 all over, or, and let me continue the rest in black, minus ln 6 over ln 5. Now this is looking better, because I can split up the numerator over subtraction, and what that means is this first term would cancel, this ln 5 over ln 5. So I think we're going to get just the number 2. So 2 minus ln 6 over ln of 5, like that. Now, the question is, what do we actually have? So first of all, I don't see a 2 out the front here. I don't think we ended up with ln 30. So I'm thinking that we end up with None of the above. Okay, now let's see if I have the correct answer. So I'm just going to try to use my calculator to see if I have the correct answer. So I'm going to type in 2 minus ln uh, 6 over ln of 5. Okay, so there we go. Then I'm going to say that that's x. So I want to go 5 raised to the negative. I'm going to put this answer up in there. So I have to go second ands for answer. So there we go. And I'm going to times that by 125. Aha, I get 30. So I think we did get the correct answer. So I'm thinking it's none of the above. Okay. So just don't get fooled by some of these other ghost answers, especially since we got a 2 here. Again, 25 squared, or sorry, it's 5 squared, so, I mean, that's not a 3 out front, so, okay, cool, all right, so hopefully that makes sense, I'm going to move on, an object is projected vertically upward from the top of a building with an initial velocity of 144 feet per second, its distance s of t in feet above the ground after t seconds is given by s of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 144 t plus 100, find the object's maximum distance above the ground. Okay, so first of all, do you note that this is a downward facing parabola? Hope that makes sense. It's a function of t. Imagine t starts at zero seconds. It goes up to however many seconds by the time it hits the ground. We want to find the object's maximum distance above the ground. Okay, so in order to find that, what we need to do is we need to find the vertex of this parabola and the vertex is something that we can calculate from the general form. By the way, um, this looks like it's in feet per second. And notice that this looks a lot like s of t equals negative one half gt squared plus vot plus s zero. G is the gravity constant. So in imperial units, I think it's like you know, US customary units, it's like 32 feet per second squared. And then times negative one half, you get the negative 16. The initial means it's thrown up at 144 feet per second. That's what we're told, and that's why it's right there. 
but it also starts at a height of 100 feet above the ground. Okay, that's why we say upward from the top of a building. Well, the idea is that if you just did a little sketch, you're starting here at 100 feet, and you're gonna go up and then down. Okay, imagine this is the ground level. Okay, so this is S of T, this is time T, okay? So we're looking for this point. Well, again, that's the vertex and the maximum point. And if you recall from a quadratic that's in the form AX squared plus BX plus C, and this one is definitely a lot like that, except X has just been replaced with T, the input that's the independent variable. Remember the formula for the x value of the vertex, in this case it's the t value of the vertex, is just going to be negative b over 2a. That's a nice formula, those of you in pre-calculus, again, introductory analysis, college algebra should know. Okay, so anyway, we can get that value, so we can say negative b, so that's negative 144 over 2 times negative 16. So let's calculate this out. So that's going to be negative 144 over negative 32. Now I'm going to let my calculator handle that for me, but I hope that comes out to a nice number. So it's negative 144 over negative 32. And lo and behold, it's four and a half seconds. 4.5 seconds. Okay, that's really useful. But then we actually want to find the object's maximum distance above the ground. So what we need is we need S of 4.5. So that's like negative 16, 4.5 squared plus 144 times 4.5 plus 100. And that should give us this S value up here for the maximum value, because we now know this value right here is 4.5 seconds. Remember, this is just like a sketch. Okay, um, so I'm going to let the calculator handle this for me as well. So let's go negative 16. Then let's go times 4.5 squared plus uh, 144 times 4.5 plus 100. There we go. Got 424. So this is equal to 424, and that would be feet. So that's this number. Obviously my sketch is not the scale, but you get the idea, and then 424 I think should be our answer. Okay, great. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's move on. Okay, so here we have a functional application that is word problem or story problem. It says, six years ago, a house was purchased for $179,000. This year was appraised for $215,000. Assuming that the value of the house after its purchase is a linear function of the time in years, approximately how many years after purchase was the house worth $193,000? Well, if we treat this as a linear function, we can use the slope formula to first find how quickly this is sloping up. And that's going to be dollars appreciated per year. Okay, so the slope would be like P2 minus P1 over T2 minus T1. I'm using P to mean price, that's the price it appraises at, and then T to be the time in years. So P2 would be 215,000. That's the later price that we know. And we know that it started out six years ago at the price of $179,000. But we're saying this year. So we're saying that this year is really year six for T2, but T1 is really zero. So we need to subtract these and divide by six. So let's go 215,000 minus 179,000 and then divide by six. So we've got 6,000. So that means like $6,000 per year. So this is $6,000 per year for the slope. We also can write down the full function. So instead of y equals mx plus b, we'll say p is equal to mt plus b. m is the slope, 
t is the independent variable. That's the input variable. Instead of x, it's t. And we know what the y-intercept is, because the y-intercept is 179,000, because that's we're taking that to be year zero. So this would be p, the price at any point, is 6,000, we worked to get that slope, times t plus 179,000. Okay, I think we're in good shape. Now we just need to figure out what year was it worth 193,000. So let's go 193,000 here, and we're gonna solve for t. So we've got 6,000 times t plus 179,000. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward, I think. Let's subtract 179,000 from both sides. Okay, so calculator. So these 179,000s cancel, and then you get 193,000 minus 179,000, and that's 14,000 equals 6,000 t. Okay, so I think what we need to do is divide by 6,000, okay? So if we divide by 6,000, we can forget about the zeros because 14,000 divided by 6,000, just forget about the zeros. It's basically just 14 divided by 6, okay? It's about 2.3, okay? So T is approximately 2.3 years, okay? Now, we need to select the best answer. Now, I don't, I'm not showing the answer choices but in terms of the answer choices, I can select one, two, three, four, or five. So I'm going to select two because it's closest to two. Because approximately how many years after the purchase was the house worth 193,000? Okay, so you know that's the idea. So two is about the right answer. All right, I'm going to take that as the right answer and move on. Okay, here we go. A forester, 182 feet from the base of a redwood tree observes that the angle between the ground and the top of the tree is 52 degrees. To the nearest foot, what is the height of the tree? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at, you know, a sort of a sketch diagram of this. Okay, so I'm gonna sketch the tree over here on the left. It's very tall. So here's this tree, it's very tall. And here's the ground. And here's the person standing. Now the person is much, much shorter than the tree. In fact, let's assume that their eyes are right near ground level. Now, it's not exactly at ground level, but let's just do it from their eyeball height, okay? So they're looking over from their eyeballs like this, and they observe that the angle is about 52 degrees. Okay, so I measured this on the whiteboard, and I got this pretty close to 52 degrees as I could. So it's about 52 degrees right here. Okay, so you can see that the tree is very tall compared to the person. So to the nearest foot, what is the height of the tree? Well, we know that the forester is 182 feet from the tree, like that. So this distance is 182 feet. Now we want to know the height of the tree. So this has formed a right triangle. And from this right triangle, you have the opposite side from the angle here and the adjacent side. So that to me sounds like tangent. So if we say the tangent of theta, that would be like h the height over x, which is this distance. So we want to say that if x is 182 multiplied by x, x times tangent of theta equals h. And then we can put the numbers in. So that's 182 feet times the tangent of 52 degrees and we're going to get the approximate value of h we're going to make sure our calculator is also in degree mode so going to the math menu or sorry going to the mode menu making sure that this is indeed in degree mode i'm going to quit out of that and i'm going to type in let's see 182 times the tangent of 52. that's in degrees and i'm going to get about 232 point maybe 95 so 232.95. What is that closest to? That's pretty close to 233 feet. So I'm gonna go with that for the correct answer. All right, hope that makes sense. Moving on. Okay, so here we have a polynomial question. Find a polynomial f of x of degree three that has zeros at negative five, two, and four. Those are the x values of the zeros and satisfies f of three equals 24. Okay, 
So we're going to need the factored form of a cubic. Now the factored form of a cubic would be like f of x, and we're going to assume that it has three zeros, and it's only degree three. So what that means is none of these zeros have any multiplicity. In other words, it's not like, you know, this twice bouncing off or this snaking through with a cubic part. This is just one, two, three real zeros. Each acts as a linear zero. So we don't know what the constant is out front. Let's call that A. And that's where this last fact will help us. But that's going to be x plus 5 times x minus 2 times x minus 4. Okay? Because that would be the factor form satisfying these zeros. Now let's see if we can cancel any of the choices. So I think they all have an x plus 5, x minus 2, and x minus 4. Okay, so we can't cancel any of the choices. But we have to find the value of a. So we have to do the calculation carefully. So we have to say f of 3, we know what the y value is. It's 24. But that's the same thing as plugging 3 into all these x's and then solving for a. So this is a times 3 plus 5. And then 3 minus 2, and then 3 minus 4. Okay, so let's start to calculate this. This is a times 3 plus 5 is 8, 3 minus 2 is 1, and then 3 minus 4 is negative 1. So the right-hand side just calculates to, looks like that's negative 8 times a, so that's negative 8a. The left-hand side does not change, it's 24. So I think we need to divide both sides by negative 8. And the last I checked, 24 divided by negative 8 should be negative. So given that a is negative 3, I'm going with the third choice down. Because the coefficient out the front should be negative and it should be 3. And then these should be the real linear zeros. Hope that makes sense. Moving on. Okay. How long will it take a sum for a sum of money to double if it is invested at a rate of 9% per year compounded continually? What we're going to do is we're going to use the continuous rate of increase equation. So that, if you recall from this course, is it's growing continuously, so the base is the natural exponential, namely e, namely Euler's number, which is approximately 2.718. So what that means is the amount of money in the account, let's call it p of t, is going to be p0 e to the RT. Now let's talk about what these things are. P is the amount in the account, T is the time, P0 is the initial amount, E is our base, I already described what that is. R is the interest rate. So R should be 0.09, because we need to get that as a decimal. Okay? And we want the sum of money to double. Now if we want the sum of money to double, watch what we can do right here. If we want that to double, we can just fill in 2P0 equals p0 e to the rt, which is 0.09t. Do you see that the p0s will cancel? We don't even need to know what the initial amount of money was. So we get 2 equals e to the 0.09t. So this is an exponential equation, relatively easy to solve, so we need to introduce natural logarithms. So introduce natural logarithms. So we're going to have the natural log of 2 is equal to the ln of e to the 0.09t. But by one of the natural log properties, this exponent can go in the front. And that's 0.09t times the natural log of e. Now hopefully you remember what the natural log of e is. That's exactly 1 because they're inverses. That's like saying e raised to what power gives e? Well, that's 1. So there we go. So we just have the ln of 2 equals 0.09t. And then to get t by itself, we're just going to divide by 0.09. So this is ln 2 over 0.09. Now, by the way, do you notice that the formula you could come up with for doubling time, this is like doubling time, is just like the natural log of 2 over r, which is the interest rate as a decimal. If you would have the tripling time, you would have just ended up with ln 3 over r. <laughs> or the quadrupling time would be ln 4 over r. Does that make sense to you? Hopefully that does. 
because you'd follow the derivation just exactly the same, except you change this to a 3 or a 4 or whatever else. Okay, so we can just calculate that in the calculator. That should just take a moment. Let's see, I think it was ln2, natural log of 2, divided by 0 0.09. So we get about 7.7 .7 years, so between 7 and 8 years. Okay. Now that seems somewhat reasonable. My father-in-law used to work for Merrill Lynch for many years. And really good mutual funds and stocks and things, really good investments, can sometimes earn up to 10 to 12% annual interest rate. That's if it's excellent. So this is 9%. But one of the rules of thumb he used to say is you hope to double your money every seven years. So does this make sense that this is 7.7 .7 years for a 9% rate of return? Now, the bank is compounding things continuously. In practice, most banks nowadays compound once a day because if you pull out your money on any given day, they want to be able to calculate it. Of course, they skip things like weekends, bank holidays, stuff like that. But the idea is that they still calculate as if it were every day. So I think 7.7 .7 years seems entirely reasonable. So I hope that makes sense and let us move on. Okay, so here what we have is we have a short calculation, approximate the cosecant of 125 degrees to four decimal places. Okay, so think about this. There's no cosecant button on your calculator, but cosecant is one over sine. So we can just do this as one over the sine of 125 degrees. Make sure your calculator is in degree mode. Okay, and let's get that approximation. So we'll go one over the sine of 125 degrees. That's about 1.22 or so, 08. So I'm thinking it's this choice. Now, by the way, 125 degrees would be in quadrant two of the unit circle. And 125 degrees, that would be still where sine is positive. Sine is positive in quadrants one and two, so we believe this is the correct answer because a couple of the answers are negative, so we're not going to use those. Okay, hope that makes sense. Okay, so in this problem, we're supposed to simplify the difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And it's for this f of x equals 3x squared minus 5x plus 2. Now, for reasons I'm not going to explain, the principal part of this should have a 6x minus 5. Those of my calculus viewers would know why that is, okay? But there might be an additional part here, which we're not sure about. There could be h or plus h or h squareds or something. But there could be something here. But anyway, you know, for reasons some of the viewers may not know, we can discount this answer, and I think we can discount even this answer. Because we should have only the 6h, sorry, 6x minus 5 to get the h to cancel. We'll see how this works. So this h on the bottom better cancel, otherwise this different quotient didn't work. So what is f of x plus h? Well, what that is, is wherever we see x, we're going to put in x plus h. So that's like 3 times x plus h squared minus 5 times x plus h plus 2. Okay, so that's the first part. Then the second part is just minusing off the regular f of x. So we're going to go minus the regular f of x. 3x squared minus 5x plus 2 like that. Now make sure we distribute that minus to each of the terms in a moment. And that's all over h. Okay, so let's get this going. So I think x plus h squared, it's got to be foiled out. So this right here would just be, let's see, this is a side calculation, x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Then we're going to times that by 3. So I think it's going to be 3 x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared. And then let's distribute this negative 5. So minus 5x minus 5h, then plus 2. And then let's distribute this minus to these terms. Minus 3x squared minus 5x, or sorry, plus, I should say, because this minus times minus is plus, plus 5x minus 2. There we go. All that over h. Another thing about difference quotients is that 
all the terms that don't involve H should cancel. You should be able to factor out an H from the numerator. So let's see if we can accomplish this. So here's a 3x squared term. That should cancel with this negative 3x squared term. Huh, that's good. These terms have H's in them, so we can't cancel those, at least not yet necessarily. Here's a negative 5x. Look at that, there's a positive 5x. Those go away. Here's a positive 2. Here's a negative 2. Those go away. So what do we have after all that canceling? We have 6xh plus 3h squared minus 5, whoops, sorry, minus 5h. Okay, so I've got all those terms, and I think that's it, all over h. Okay, so this, because this looks uh, I want this to look better. I'm going to move this, sorry, I'm going to move this term up the front, or, or sorry, to the middle term, just so it'll look better. And I'm also going to factor out an H, because I already mentioned that out loud. So if you factor out H, which we must do, otherwise the difference quotient didn't work, because we have to be able to cancel this H momentarily. So we factor out H, we've got 6X minus 5, and then plus 3H, all over H. And now comes that lovely moment where these H's cancel, and it looks like we obtain 6x minus 5, which is what we were hoping for, but then plus a 3H. So we didn't know what that last part was, plus the 3H. Okay, and which of the choices is that? Well, it's the plus 3H, so I'm thinking it's this choice. So there we go, the fourth choice down. Hope that makes sense. Thank you for your attention. Let's move on. Okay, so what we have here is we have the point p is 3 comma 9. It's on the graph of a function f. And we're going to find the corresponding point if we transform the function by such. So it's 1 third f of 1 half x minus 1. I want to go from inside to outside in terms of the transformations. So what that means is I'm going to start here with the 1 half. So what that means is I'm going to sort of cut the point by one half in terms of x, and then I'm going to adjust the y by multiplying by this third and then minus and one. So you'll see what happens. Okay, so, so let's start off at the point 3, 9, and let's see what happens to this point. It's going to undergo three transformations. Of course, it's not going to stay 3, 9, but I'm just setting up the, the targets, if you will, for these transformations. Okay, so for the first transformation, what's going to happen is we're going to multiply x by 1 half. So what that means is the y value stays the same, but the x value gets, so it's a little hard to explain, but we're going to, when we do time, 1 half times x, the x actually becomes 6. So the thing is, let me explain why this is. I've kind of explained this in previous videos. Whenever you're that close to x, like you're inside the parentheses, you're multiplying by 1 half. In order to retain originally what we had, x has to get boosted up to 6. So when we're doing 1 half x, what we're saying is that um, when x is 6, 1 half x gives us 3, then we retain the same output. I hope that kind of makes sense. So this should actually be... 6, 9. Now notice they almost threw me with this choice, but that choice is incorrect. We don't do 3 times a half. We get 6. So I'm leaning towards this already, but let's see if we can verify that. The next transformation is we're going to do 1 third times the y value, the current y value. In other words, the f of the 1 half x. So 1 third times that y value is basically you take the 6 and the 9, you t take that output of y and multiply it by a third. So 9 times a third is going to give you 3. So that's just going to give you 6, 3. Okay, I hope that makes sense. 6, 3. And then last but not least, we're going to subtract 1. So what that means is we're going to go y minus 1, the current value of y minus 1. So what that means is this 3 just becomes a 2. So 6, 2 is what I'm leaning towards, and indeed that should be the final answer. So that's the only one that has x is 6, and indeed y is 2, which is what we were expecting. Okay, great. So understand how you do transformations. When you're really close to x, 
you kind of do the inverse of what you'd expect. So if you had a one half in there, you're actually multiplying the x by two. <laughs> and then, but multiplying on the outside in terms of a vertical stretch or shrink, it kind of just multiplies the y's. Okay, hope that makes sense. Hope that was helpful. Let's move on. Okay, so here we have a properties of logarithms question. So we have log of y equals log of b minus k log of x. So I'm thinking that if we just want to get y in terms of a nice expression on the right-hand side and get rid of the logs, we need to condense here. Now in terms of the order of operations of condense, we need to start here first. This k, by what I've said in other videos, it can come up and become the exponent on the x. So that would be one of the logarithm properties. So this is going to be log of b minus log of x raised to the k. Again, that's a property of logarithms. Now there's another property of logarithms in terms of condensing that says when you have a subtraction of two logarithms, you can make it a division of a single logarithm. So that's log of b over x to the k, like that. But now that's equal to log of y. But now we can use the one-to-one -one property of logarithms. If log of y equals log of this mess, then y just equals this mess. So y should equal b over x to the k. So let's see if we can find that. b over x to the k. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Second one down. Hope that makes sense. And let's move on. Okay, here we go. On a certain route, an airline carries 8,000 passengers per month, each paying $50. A market survey indicates that for each $1 increase in price, the airline will lose 100 passengers. Find the ticket price that maximizes the revenue for the route. Okay, so let's think about this. We can charge more money. So if we charge more money, we're going to have less passengers but what we're going to get is we're going to maximize this function. Now this function is going to have to be a quadratic for the sake of this class. Maximization for the sake of this class is too hard to do um, unless you have calculus skills. But let's just read this over carefully. On a certain route, an airline carries 8,000 passengers per month, each paying $50. Okay, so what that means is normal, you could say the revenue is equal to 8,000 times 50 bucks. There we go. But it says for each $1 increase in price. So now let's see if we can get the revenue equation. So that'd be like revenue as a function of X. Now X is the price increase. So that's gonna be like 50 plus X plus every one X, okay? So every time X goes up by one unit, what's happening to the revenue x is that's what's happening to the price so this is price and this is number of passengers so the number of passengers is going down by um uh 100. so that would be like 8,000. uh i think minus 100x now let's think about how i got that because that's like saying if x goes up by one we lose 100 passengers. By, oh, it goes up by $1. If X goes up by 2, we lose 200 passengers. Now, the point is, we don't know exactly what this looks like, but just because you see that this term is going to multiply this term, we're going to get a negative X squared. So that is, we're going to get a downward-facing parabola. So if we sketch it, you can imagine that there's going to be some maximum to the revenue. So there's going to be some sweet spot where the revenue is maximized for a certain price. That's like right here. We're going to find that point. And that's going to be the vertex of the parabola. So let's multiply this out and let's get the vertex. So R of X would be like, let's see, 8,000 times 50. So 5 times 8 is 40. But then we have 1, 2, 3, 4 more zeros. That's 40,000, or sorry, 400,000. And then 8,000 times x, that's plus 8,000x minus, now this is 100 times 50, so that's 5 times 1, and then three zeros. That's 5,000x, and then finally minus 100x squared. All right, let's clean this up, and let's put the quadratic term first. Let's go minus 100x squared, 
Then this is going to be 8,000 minus 5,000, so that's plus 3,000 x, yes, pl uh, plus 400,000. Okay, so there we have our quadratic. So now, if this is the coefficient a, this is the coefficient b, this is the coefficient c, hopefully you remember this from your class, the x value of the vertex is going to be negative b over 2a. That's a useful formula to know for the course. Well, let's do negative b, so that's negative 3,000 over 2 times negative 100. So that's negative 3,000 over negative 200, which is really just 3,000 over 200. So let's forget about two of the zeros. So that's 30 over 2, which is 15. So that's a $15 price increase, price increase. And then remember what the final question asks, find the ticket price that maximizes the revenue for the route. Well, we start with $50, but if we're gonna do a $15 price increase, then that means the ticket price is $65. Okay, because we do 50 plus $15. So that's gonna be $65 on the nose. And that would be this. So this is 15. And again, this is the increase on this axis and the revenue on that axis. And there we go. All right, so we found the price that maximizes the revenue. By the way, you could calculate the revenue. You could put 15 back into either this equation or, say, this equation. It doesn't really matter. You could find what the revenue is. Hope that makes sense, and let's move on. Okay, here we go. We're going to solve the equation log base 3 of x minus 4 equals 2. So this is a logarithmic equation, base 3. So we need to exponentiate both sides, base 3. So, so this will be 3 raised to the log base 3 of x minus 4 equals 3 to the second. So we exponentiated both sides. Both sides of the equation became exponents in an exponential equation. Log base 3, that just cancels out because they're just inverses. So you just get x minus 4. And then what is 3 squared? Well, that's just 9. So this is pretty easy to solve. Just add 4. To both sides, x is 13. So I think x is 13, and there's our answer. Okay, hope that makes sense. That's a pretty straightforward logarithmic equation to solve using introducing exponentials both sides of the equation. In other words, exponentiating both sides of the equation. All right, thanks for your attention, and let's move on. Okay, so here we go. It says, find the standard equation of a parabola that has x-intercepts of negative 4 and 6, and the lowest point has a y-coordinate of negative 7. Okay, so there's a couple ways we could do this, but I'm going to suggest, because we have the x-intercepts, and we know the lowest point, we can deal with it in those ways. So let's start off with, so let's start off with the x-intercepts. So we know this is going to be like y equals some constant out the front times x plus 4 times x minus 6. That's the parabola in factored form because we're assuming linear zeros because we have two real x-intercepts. And we don't know what the constant out the front is. Okay, so anyway, there it is. But we also know its low, lowest point has a y-coordinate of negative 7. So if we put in negative 7 here, the question is, what is the x value? Now, we actually need to look back to here and be a little bit clever. When you consider a parabola and where its x-intercepts are, so let me make a little sketch of this. So here's the sketch that we have negative 4 here. 1, one 2, 3, 4, negative 4. And then we have 6 for the other x-intercept. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 right here. Notice the vertex, because the parabola is symmetric, the vertex will always be halfway, in terms of its x-coordinate, between these two. In other words, it'll be the average of 6 and negative 4. So the average of 6 and negative 4, I believe, is 1 because that's five units to the right of negative four and five units to the left of six. So that's one right there. So basically the parabola must do this, something like that. Now obviously that's not the best sketch, but you get the idea. So the thing is, x here ends up being one. 
So it's a times 1 plus 4. 1 minus 6. Okay, so to be a little bit clever to know how to do that. So this is negative 7 equals, now we can solve for a. a times, that's 5. And then we're going to have, let's see, negative 5. So we're going to have negative 7 equals, now 5 times negative 5 is negative 25 um, times a. So then a, by dividing by negative 25, is 7 over 25. So now we go back to this equation. And then we'll say, um, let's see, y equals 7 over 25 times, and then by the way, we might as well start writing these out, like foiling them out, x plus 4 times x minus 6, because in order to get the standard equation of a parabola, sometimes called the vertex form, we need to complete the square. Now, we could complete the square. The other way to do this is we, we do know that this x value is 1, and then we know this y value is negative 7. So I could probably just put that in straight away. I could just do x minus 1 squared minus 7, because h comma k is 1 comma negative 7. The other way you could have done this is if you would have multiplied this out, you could have kept 7 over 25 on the outside, you could have completed the square. I've shown that in other videos, but you'd have ended up with the same thing. Okay, but we might as well just use the vertex because we already have it. Okay, so there we go. So it's 7 over 25, x minus 1, squared minus 7. Okay, so I think this looks like the correct answer. Okay, so that concludes this exam, this, you know, exam that I had to take for work. Thank you very much for your attention. Hope that was helpful. And let's move on. In other words, let's move on with the rest of our life. And hopefully this helps in terms of your college algebra, introductory to analysis, or pre-calculus class. All right. Thanks.